left. We are less than two weeks away from one of the most anticipated midterm elections in history. I'm not trying to sound melodramatic here, but pundits have been pretty busy leading up to November 8th. Joining me tonight are guest political analyst Dr. Robert Dian, associate professor of political science, the Agile Hart Chair at the University of Evansville. Dr. Dian, it is very good to see you. Where do we begin on this one? But uh, I'll, I'll start with this line, and I know you know where this came from. It's the economy, stupid. James Carville. And beginning with the way the economy is right now, leading up to the election, the midterm, usually the party in power is at a disadvantage to begin with. Right. How much is that going to put the Democrats, is putting the Democrats in jeopardy? Uh, it's a tough year for Democrats because of the economy, because of the fact that they're in power. So you have to expect that in a midterm, typically, they're going to lose some seats. The big question is, and we'll find out in 12 days, uh, how bad the, the loss will be. It could be rather modest, and there were some times uh, about a month ago where it looked like the Democrats were going to hang on. Uh, and then there's been talk uh, all year long that there might be a red wave out there, and it's all going to come down to the next 12 days. And, and polls show more Americans feel that, that these midterms are very important. There's very high interest in mm. this. What do you attribute that to? Well, I think there's a lot going on. We just went through a, a, a terrible pandemic. We've had all sorts of economic disruptions. We've got Russia invading Ukraine. Lots of uh, challenges out there. Uh, the thing I'm going to be looking for is to see whether turnout is high, because typically in a midterm, you're looking at 30-something percent. But in 2018, we actually cracked 50 percent for the first time in 100 years. And there's every indication that we're going to do every bit as well this year. Early voting is very high all across the country. Um, and I think that's because, first of all, people are concerned that the country is going in the wrong direction. But secondly, the thing that was really stunning to me as somebody who's been watching this is that about a month ago, in a poll, uh, the number one issue on people's minds was, are we going to be a democracy for very long? And, and that brings me to this, uh, this talking point, and that is... Um you know, we have lived in polarizing times, okay? The 1960s, uh, the years of the Reagan administration, Nixon, and all that. But there seems to be a doomsday scenario. It's like you have two parties here. One party says, if they win, that's the end of our country. And that party is saying the exact same thing right. as the other party. That, that's pretty dramatic, even in politics. Yeah, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll remind students about how rough and tough it was back in 1800 when, <laughs> when Jefferson ran against Adams. So this is nothing new. Politics is rough outside of our country, and it's been rough in our history. But you're not exaggerating. There are, there are polls that indicate that people would be mad if their child married someone from a different party. And that seems a little excessive. Uh, we've really got to do a better job as a country to try to make an effort to, to come together and, and reason as normal people. Um, it's, it's not clear how that can be because so many factors in the world right now are making things worse rather than better. And it doesn't help that everybody is sort of off in their corner reading different Twitter feeds and listening to different echo chambers. And we have definitely customized the news that we personally want to right. listen to and watch. The Trump effect, we're talking about... Uh, democracy here, the January 6th committee. Mm -hmm. One interesting poll said that, you know, people have been, uh, well, uh, kind of uh, riveted about these hearings in Washington, D.C., but one poll suggests that a lot of people will still vote for the candidates, even if they are, for example, election deniers. Right. Uh, they're still going to vote for them. They're not letting that affect their vote on some of these other races. Yeah, the power of party identification is well well known in political science, and you would expect that to be their their default vote. If you're a, a member of a party, a follower, you would expect that person to vote that way. Um, the striking thing is, you, you said election deniers, but there was a poll last week that even said that if if the candidate of your party had a serious moral failing, that uh, would you still vote for that person? And people are saying yes, if he's in my party. I have to support him. So we've become very tribal in the last couple of years. However, there's also countervailing evidence that people would be happier if people compromised more or communicated better. Uh, and so I think, I, I think there's a thread of hope out there that uh, perhaps there's a, uh, um, we might be on the brink to the point where people will say, you know, maybe we've got to 
change our direction. President Joe Biden's approval ratings are now around in the 40s, somewhere there. But uh, Democrats, many Democratic candidates, they're not being disrespectful to him, but they are distancing themselves. And some have actually gone beyond his poll numbers. Right, absolutely. And, and that's a common thing is that a lot of House members are from safe seats and, and they'll do better than the presidential candidate. Um, clearly, if it's a close race, if it's an open seat or if it's a highly competitive seat and Joe Biden's not helping you, then even Joe Biden, who's an old timer, understands that you don't want to go near that. So people are in it for themselves. We call it candidate centered campaigning rather than party driven campaigning. And I think Joe Biden's popularity has sort of been up and down, but he's, he's pretty much where Obama and Trump were right. at this time. And uh, we've got less than a minute now, sure. but we have to talk about Roe v. Wade and the impact it's having. Obviously, there's that critical vote in Kentucky, but also, you know, there's been this, uh, on both sides of this issue, people are saying, I'm voting, if they voted to abolish Roe v. Wade, right. we're going after them at the polls. That's the only way we can change things. Right. What do you say? It's, this is something that I've never seen in my life because for 49 years Roe v. Wade was the law of the land. This is something entirely unexpected, almost unthinkable a year ago. Uh, and there's no doubt that it's, it's one of the top issues. It's not the number one, but you're right, a whole class of people have felt sort of rocked by right. this development and it's going to drive voting behavior. And there was that shocker in Kansas where uh, unexpectedly, overwhelmingly, that conservative state said, by God, we want to have reproductive freedom in our state. We'll see if Kentucky follows suit. Uh, it's all going to come out in uh, 12, 12 days. All right. Dr. Robert Dyan, thank you so much for joining us. Well, looking forward to seeing how you react on November 8th. Be because it is going to be an, a good story, a right. great news story. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Brandon, to you. Brad, thank you.